welcome new subscribers. Thank you subscribers for following, sharing our videos, supporting our channel. If you're new to our channel, hit that subscribe button right now. My name is Reverend Penelope Stewart. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you for being here with me today. Uh, I'm still on... I'm still on this, you know, looking at this this Black Native American thing. And one of my uh, questions was to the ancestors was, how in the heck did we go from copper color? Let me type this in. Uh, how did we go from copper color to what we see today? You know, I found that, that very odd because th these people are not copper color. And as I have mentioned before, especially in my book, Matriarch the Patriarch, native doesn't mean that you're indigenous. You can, I can come here from a different place, have a baby here, and then my child is native to America. So that doesn't mean that you have to be indigenous to be Native American. Okay, so my thing was, I was asking ancestors, who are these people? Because they are not the copper color races. American and Native of America originally applied to the aboriginals or copper color races found here by Europeans, but now applied to descendants of Europeans born in America. All right? So who are these people? Because they do not look like the copper color races that Columbus talked about being here. They do not look like those people. So, so you know, who are these people? You know, we don't know who these people are. And we, you know, I had to ask these questions. You know, who, how did they turn from copper colored, dark skinned people to looking Asiatic and Caucasian? You know, how does that happen? You know, and where did these copper colored people go? You know, was our identity stolen from these people? Is this a Native American people that the government set up because I've always thought that I always thought that these people were a Native American people that the government set up these were these were not indigenous people you know and I didn't know how close I was to being right until I came up on this video about doing my research how Asian slaves became Indians and Native Americans I thought this is a very interesting video uh, you can go to her channel it's called 1828 noble american this is a book review we're going to listen to maybe about 15 or 20 minutes of this video and then i'm gonna go back i'm gonna come back and i'm gonna show you and confirm what she is saying in this video and it just knocked my socks off that i can go online and kind of confirm some of the things that she was saying all right so we're gonna listen to her for a minute, give a book review on Asian slaves in Colonia, Mexico, to kind of give us an idea of how these Native Americans, so to speak, how they're no longer copper color, how they're something else. And this is really, this information, it just, you know, I get so fired up because these people, they just lie and lie and lie. So. Please pardon me if I get a little fired up because this is one of my passions and the lies just, oh my gosh, they're just, they're, just, they're, they're, they're just too much. They're just too much. So let's just go in and, and listen. Third episode of the show, Black Movement Radio, and the title today, we will be discussing how Asian slaves became Indians. I'm going to go into depth about how Chinos became reclassified as Indians or indigenous people. Moreover, while indigenous people were reclassified as African and Negroes, Chino slaves were allowed to obtain an indigenous identity and status. The main source of information used for this discussion will be from the book Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico. From Chinos to Indians by Tatiana Sayas. What's interesting here is that the subject of Asian slaves in Spanish America is not discussed or widely known. In fact, in Tatiana Sayas' book, she states that her book 
is the first that traces Chino origins in Asia. My goal in this particular episode is to touch on key points which is not readily known to the public. All right. After parts of Asia were conquered by the Spanish crown, Asian people were put into slavery on their own land and later on shipped to places such as Mexico, Peru, and Chile. In other words, they were shipped to Spanish-controlled colonies in America. Now, this is a quote from the book, Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico. Quote, the foundation of the Spanish Philippines gave rise to the trans-Pacific slave trade. Manila became the colonial outpost in Asia where slaves were purchased and the Manila Galleon ships afforded transport to Mexico. Manila was a slave society during the 17th century. Slaves did the majority of the labor and master-slave relations shaped the general social order. Within years after the Spanish conquest, the bustling port city had some 40,000 residents of diverse origins. A full quarter of this population was enslaved. They were craftspeople, manual laborers, and servants who upheld their master's social structure. By the 1620s, the city had 8,000 indigenous slaves and 2,000 foreign slaves, in addition to an untold number of Muslim slaves. The whole of the city, the whole of the city was a slave market, supplying labor to Spanish colonists and indigenous elites. Slave auctions were held in the plazas found within the city walls, and masters also sold slaves through individual transactions. The unorganized nature of the market makes it nearly impossible to quantify the volume of slaves, but it is clear that Manila was an emporium for slaves. Masters from throughout the Philippines knew to come to the capital to secure chattel property. Now these Slaves were from diverse places, and they were called Chino slaves. And they came from places such as Filipinos, India, Philippines, India, Bengal, Indonesia, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Japan, China, and other places. Now, once in Mexico, all of these people became Chino slaves. Now, here is a backstory of what took place in the Philippines. And what took place in the Philippines also mirrors what took place in America when both empires, the Philippines and America, fell to the Spanish crown. I'm gonna read a page from the book, Asian Slaves in Colonial Mexico, and it's from page 46. Okay, it said, it says, quote, the Spanish government instituted the same forms of labor organization in the Philippines as in the American colonies, first allowing colonists to have encomitas and then pushing for reform with the reptimento system. Under Encomitas, a Spaniard was allowed, was allotted a group of Indians who owed him personal service. Repartimento was a crown control system that required Indians to work for nominal pay. Okay, so I use that quote just to show how what happened in the Philippines and the Americas, they operated under the same types of system, which was pretty much a caste system where the lighter skin would kind of become the, um, the Chino slaves or the Indians. And then at the bottom, you would have the reclassified indigenous people uh, being reclassified as Negroes working uh, at the bottom in the sugar plantations and in the fields and the rice plantations. Okay, so that's why I use that quote to show that both the Philippines 
and Spanish America, now Spanish America, uh, were under the Spanish crown. And the type of system that operated was the same in the Philippines and it was the same in Spanish America, right? Now, at this point in history, the indigenous people were being subdued and people belonging to the lighter skinned races helped the colonists subdue the real indigenous people of the land. A clear example of this taking place is in the Philippines. Now you see these Indians, these they ain't even in, they ain't even Indians, but these Native Americans, they look like these people. And I bet you if you was to test their blood, that's why I tell y'all this blood test stuff ain't gonna work. It's not gonna work. It's not going to work because these people are from different parts of the world. Their blood test is going to come back Asian, Filipino, something like that. All right. This is something that the government has set up. These are Native Americans that the government set up. All right. So the blood test really ain't going to work. That's why I said the DNA test is not going to work. It's not going to work. It's, it's not sufficient. All right. That's why I say that. But, and this this proves my point right here. And I, you're going to see more. As I move on, this is really going to prove my point as we begin to look at some more literature. Quote, in the Philippines, both systems allowed for slavery because the native elites were responsible for delivering the laborers to the Spaniards. The lawful enslavement of the indigenous group Negritos exemplifies the leeway given to native chiefs regarding slavery. The colonial government gave permission to the indigenous elites of the larger ethnic group to carry out their own slaving raids. The command Pangans, for example, who lived in a fertile province of Pamanga had license to enslave Negritos. The Kamapan, the Kapanmapagans, you understand what I'm saying, excuse me for the mispronunciation. The Kapamangans were allowed to go to war against their natural enemies, enslave them, and make them work in the rice cultivation. End quote. So later on, the Gritos were reclassified as Negroes and lost their indigenous status and became Negro slaves. Now, there are other words that um, that they say that the Negritos, that's their, they say there really are uh, Aeta, like A-E-T-A, okay? Um, because Negrito means little Negroes. And I'm not pretty sure, I'm not sure what they were called at that particular time when their nation was being subdued by the lighter skinned natives. But they were indeed reclassified um, as Negritos and they were forced to work on the rice plantation. And as you can see, uh, what happened with the Kappa Man Pangans they worked with the Spanish crown to subdue the true indigenous peoples of the Philippines, okay? Meanwhile, in America, indigenous people were also being reclassified as Negroes and forced to work on plantations. Now, I'm gonna use an example from the article titled, The Use of Terms Negro and Black to include persons of Native American ancestry in Anglo-North America by Jack D. Forbes. Quote, Negro was also used in a general way in the North American colonies. Some examples illustrate the use of Negro and Black as applied to people of American ancestry. An example is from the West Indies is especially illuminating. In 1764, William Young was sent to St. Vincent as a part of the British occupation of that island. Living on St. Vincent were about 3,000 Black Caribs 
or free Negroes, about 100 red Caribs or Indians, and some 4,000 French and their slaves, according to Young. The British found it difficult to control the Caribs and wars were fought with them in 1771 through 1772. And again, during 1795 through 1796. During the latter crisis, Young wrote an extremely anti-Carib tract designed to prove that the Caribs should be removed from St. Vincent. They were eventually defeated and some 5,000 Caribs were shipped to an island near the coast of Honduras. Young was anxious to prove that the so-called Black Caribs were not Aborigines, but were in fact Negro colonists, free Negroes, or Negro usurpers. This was important to him because he wanted to show they had no bona fide land rights or Aboriginal title. This tendency continues, incidentally, amongst white scholars who even today refuse to accept the Caribs' avowed feelings of Indianness and continues to call them black. Now, this is, is what happened and what they still do today, okay? So at that time, the indigenous people were fighting and were being reclassified as Negro and black, and there were some lighter skin, uh, native peoples who were helping them okay so you heard it you heard it here you can come back and watch this video uh, at your leisure is how asian slaves became indians native americans uh, this is the 1828 noble american channel here uh, and she's doing a book review from asian slaves in colonia mexico all right a uh, very good video I give this this is like a five star video which I give it ten stars really good information it came in right when I needed it and so when I got through watching this video I finished this video and I said okay what where can I find confirmation from this where where can I go to find confirmation for this and so uh, the ancestors led me here you know, uh, and I'm gonna read this article here for you. I thought this is very interesting. This is a very interesting article and it confirmed everything that she was saying in that video. Uh, Wendell Chino, born 1923 to 1998, was nationally recognized Native American leader. For most of his life, he served as a president of the Marcelero Apache Nation. Remember, they put the lighter-skinned people over the darker-skinned people. You know, they gave them indigenous status, all right? Native status. During his tenure, he raised his tribe from poverty and helped it become one of the most prosperous in American history. This is how they got these casinos started. As an advocate of American Indian rights, tribal sovereignty, Wendell Chino was one of the most innovative, influential Native American leaders, advancing the philosophy of red capitalism. He encouraged tribes to regain control of their lands and attain economic freedom. Further through his example, Chino provided tribes with practical templates for self-governance and business management. Chino, the son of Sam Chino, was born December 25th, 1923. Pay attention to that date because we're going to go over some more stuff. The Clovis culture and this date is going to be very important when we go over the Clovis culture, okay? 1928 on the Mesolero Reservation in New Mexico. The year after his birth, the U.S. Congress granted American citizenship to all Native Americans. All right, so they was born here. Look at here. He was born here, which made him a native to America. See, don't let these words get you to that. He wasn't indigenous. All right, he was born here in 1923. All right, and the Congress granted American citizenship to all natives to Americans. All right, so don't get it twisted now. So. 
what is a Native American? Somebody born here. Somebody come from somewhere else and was born here can be a native to America. They're not indigenous, they're not Indians, all right? 11 years before Chino's birth, his parents were freed by the U.S. Army, all right? So this, this, this father confirms that they were prisoners of war after they had been incarcerated as prisoners of war. All right, so these, and that confirms what she was saying. These lighter complected uh, people were over the darker skinned people. All right, and they start to mimic, they, 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 the indigenous status was given to them. All right, upon the release, they were afforded two options. They could either move to Oklahoma, gave them options, or to New Mexico, where they could settle on the Marcelero Reservation located 200 miles south of Albuquerque. The Chinos chose the Chinos. All right, we go back to the Chinos. The Chinos chose New Mexico Reservation, an area of land that included 720 square miles nestled in Sacramento Mountains in south central part of the state. The reservation has been established in, eight, in 1873 and provided a home for approximately 4,000 Apaches. By the time Chino was born, little had changed on the reservation in terms of Apache's lifestyle. Tribal members subsisted on a few farm crops depending upon supplies the U.S. government, of the, from the U.S. government. Further, the reservation housed no form, form of industry jobs opportunities for the inhabitants were almost non-existent. When he became an adult, Chino was substantially improved would substantially improve the prospects of the reservation inhabitants. Little is known about his early life of the future of the tribal leader beyond the education experience. And that's for a good reason, because see, they don't want you to know that they made these Native Americans, that the Native Americans that you see today are descendants from these people right here who were our overseers, who are our ancestors' overseers. And now they have the status, have our indigenous status. He attended the Santa Fe Indian School in New Mexico, later Central College in Pella, Iowa, and the Cook Christian School in Phoenix, Arizona. In 1951, he graduated from Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan. That same year, he was ordained as a minister in Dutch Reformed Church. After, after ordination, he returned to the reservation. Okay, we're going to, this is when we get into, uh, the casino. They said he served as a president for 43 years, though he was often described as an iron fisted aerocratic and aerocratic. He proved to be an innovative leader who successfully developed and diversified his tribe's business pursuit. Sound like an overseer to me. All right. He remained a president for 43 years. All right. And he was. You know, he was elected to be over these people. Uh, let's go in and have when he started developing business. Because, see, this is how the casinos and stuff first got started. Let me go down here. See, established resorts and kids casinos. This is why I was like, you know, how is they able to, you know, establish these casinos like this? How is they able, how are they able to do that? But when you got the American government backing you up, I guess anything is possible. At, at the Marcelo, Marcelo Reservation, Chino's most ambitious and profitable project involved the creation of the ski resort called the Inn Mountain, the Inn of the Mountain, Mountain Gods, a recreational facility in the 12,000 foot Sierra Blanca Mountain. The resort, which was built in resort that was built in 1975, not only generated steady income, it provided employment for the reservation dwellers. 250 room resort, including championship caliber golf course, the first tribal-owned course in the United States. When Chino first suggested the idea, fellow tribe members were taken aback as they were completely unfamiliar with the sport. Indeed, even Chino had never played golf. Yeah, right. You had to get that idea from somewhere. All right, you got that idea from somewhere because that, that, that's, a, you know, this, this, that, that's the Caucasian sport. All right, so where did he get that, that idea from? 
all right nevertheless he went ahead with the project transforming farmland pictured pretoric terrain into a hundred acre course with the rocky hillsides along creeks and adjacent to the lake marcella road the course provided immediate success moreover it was a pioneering endeavor other tribes followed suit in subsequent years more than 50 tribal on golf courses would emerge in 17 states from American Southwest to the upper Midwest. Later, Marcelo Road Resort property housed a casino. Even though New Mexico had outlawed gambling, Chino circumvented the legal technicality by claiming tribal sovereignty for the reservation. The casino proved as trendy, trendsetting as the golf course and other reservations followed. Chino's entrepreneurial and economic economic lead about his efforts toward economic self-sufficiency. Chino once reported joke that the Zuni makes jewelry, the Navajo makes blanket, and the Apaches make money. You know, who are these Apaches? Who are these who are these people? Alright, it says because of his leadership abilities and accomplishment, Chino gained national recognition and became a spokesman for Indian issues. Again, he's not saying Native American. He's saying Indian issues. Even before he established the resort. All right. So know the difference. These people, they're, they're Native American. Let's go on. In 1968, he was a member of the U.S. delegation of the 6th Inter-American Indian Congress held at Patacaro, Mexico. The same year, he was appointed chairman of New Mexico Commission of Indian Affairs. He also served as president of National Congress of American Indians. See, they put again, they put these light-skinned people above the indigenous people. See how they gave him this position and was appointed by President Lyndon Johnson, all right, to the National Council of Indian Opportunity, which had established to foster Native American participation in U.S. government. Native American. They're not calling him Indian. They're calling him Native American. Foster Native American participation in U.S. government decisions concerning Indian, 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 Indian policies. All right, they still got this, this crap going on where they making these people, they giving these people indigenous status over the true Indians that were already here. Okay, I hope that's making sense to you. I'm getting ready to wrap this video up. So let's look at the Clovis culture. You know, remember I told you that date was gonna be important because it said this guy was born in December of 1925 or 1923. Let's go back and look at that. Saying that he was born in December. Uh, let's, let's, cause this date. December 1923. Okay, let's go to the Clovis culture. It said the Clovis culture is a prehistoric Paleo Indian culture named for distinct stone tools found in close association with the Pleistocene, Pleistocene fauna at Blackwater locality number one near Clovis, Mexico, New Mexico, in the 1920s and the 1930s. Now. This is my theory. It could be wrong, but I found it absolutely, you know, coincidental that this Clovis people come into effect when these Native American people are being created in Mexico. All right, all of a sudden, it's this Clovis culture are the first people to the set foot in the Americas crossing the Bering Straits, which I think is impossible because when you look at the Bering Straits, you mean to tell me, you know, let's look at these Bering Straits. You mean to tell me these people crossed all the way, they, they passed up all this fertile land in the Americas. If I have to look at this, let me find one with, with a, you know, with a good picture of America. Here we go. You mean to tell me these people crossed all the way across here and 
passed up all this fertile land to go all the way into Mexico. All right? And they they were, you know, they, they wasn't dark. All right? They're going to pass up all this fertile land. And then when you ask them who built the mounds, they'll tell you, these Native Americans, they'll tell you if they was truly the Clovis people and they was really here, they would tell, they told, they told some of the, the, the colon, colonizers they asked them, the colonizer asked them, did y'all build these mounds? They said, no, it was an earlier civilization. All right? That was ran off from, from their land. They, they told the colonizers that they did not build those mounds. So who the hell is the Clovis? Sorry, who, who the hell is these Clovis people? I apologize. I mean, the lies on top of lies. I, I, I get, get, get so fired up every time I talk about this. Okay, so who, who is these Clovis people? You mean to tell me y'all passed by all of this right here? All this right here to go into. that that is Again, this is a theory. And I'm going to go back to this. All right? So it says they appeared around 11,000 years ago. All right? That's, it said in, in the 19th, it appears around 11,000 years ago. Uncalibrated radiocarbon years before the present at the end of the last glacier is characterized by the manufacture of Clovis Point. Manufacture of Clovis Point. Manufacture of Clovis Point. Manufacture of Clovis Point. You manufacture, you making stuff. And distinctive bones and ivory tools, archaeologists most precise, which that don't mean that these Clovis people, you know what I'm saying? These are not Clovis people. These people are indigenous people. All right, they've already said that there were people here before the clo this Clovis theory they come up with. They came up with this theory to justify these Asian Asian people as being Native Americans, being the first people here. They they made that crap up. Archaeologists' most precise determination at present suggests that the radiocarbon age is equally to roughly thirteen thousand to twelve thousand calendar years ago. Clovis people are considered to be the ancestors of the most indigenous cultures of America, which they has, they're lying. Again, these Clovis people did never exist. Not like the way they're saying. No, not like the way they're saying. Because these Clovis people are supposed to be in connection with these Asiatic uh, Chino people. All right? It says the only human burial that has been directly associated with the tools. See, they don't even got a human body. They just found some tools, and those tools could have belonged to our ancestors, you know, that, that, that migrated in that area. Clovis culture included the remains of an infant boy researchers named Anzic, a paleogenetic analysis of Anzic 1 ancient nuclear mitochondrial Y chromosome DNA revealed that Anzic is closely related to the modern Native American population. So that means that 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 even that baby that they found, how in the heck is he, his DNA is more closer to the Native American, the, the modern Native American population that they made now. Just letting you know that they manufacturing this, which lends support to the Berigen hypothesis. Okay? Hypotheses. Again, this is a theory. Hypotheses is a theory for the sediment of America. Okay, so you you already know this 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 ain't even real. They make they're making this up, and archaeologists have already said that there were people here before the Clovis culture. Okay, all right. So let's you know, and then they got telling them they was the, the first to be in a new world. No, they're not. You know. I made a video on that. You may you can go see Graham Hancock stuff because he talked about there was people here before the Clovis culture. See, they made this crap up. All right, they they made this up. All right, and they, he sit here and tells you the Clovis culture replaced by several more localized regional societies from younger, driest, cold climate period onward. Post Clovis cultures include false tradition. Uh. Ganey, Sawney, Simpson, Plainview, Goshen, Cumberland, Redstone. Each of these is thought to derive directly from Clovis, which is a lie. 
You know what I'm saying? This, this, this is a lie. This is a theory, because you're seeing them saying that this is a hypothesis. This is no, they can't even find a body to rep, to represent these Clovis people. They, they found nothing but tools, all right? You know, they found nothing but tools. And so you've seen, you know, I've showed you all the proof where these Native Americans that we see in the day, they are not indigenous, they are Chino people. You know, I, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope it was very enlightening. It, it, this information sure helped me a lot. And I thank you so much for supporting the channel and being here with me today. Light and love, may the ancestors be with you.